And the Prime Minister is here now, Chris Hipkins, as he is every Tuesday morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, Good morning. We've got a lot to get through this morning, so I won't waste any time. This increase on excess uh, duties for alcohol will see, for the first time, 50% of a dozen beer will be made up of tax, uh, that's GST and also excise. Is that a bit unfair in a cost of living crisis? Um, the, this, um, the change in um, excise for alcohol is something that's happened every year since 1991. Um, it's a CPI calculation. Um, yes, it's a higher increase this year because CPI, you know, the inflation has been running higher. Um, so, uh, you know, like I don't think anyone likes to see the price of beer and wine going up, um, but ultimately it's, it's a change that's basically happened every year. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you have to make the change. There is a lot of leeway and discretion in the legislation that you can change that figure. So during a cost of living crisis, when Kiwis want to go and have a beer to unwind from work on a Friday, you're going to charge them more and the brewers aren't happy. I mean, ultimately, if the government was to decrease the levies in this space, we'd need to find that money from somewhere else. So, um, yes, I understand. No one particularly likes to see the price of you know beer and wine going up. But like everything else within the economy, um, you know, inflation is playing a role here. So these are adjustments that happen every year yeah, as no, inflation you know um, continues to pu pu push prices up. Um, this happens. This has happened every year. Yeah, but, but, I acknowledge sorry, that. Now, if we were to yeah. say, okay, we're going, we're not, we're not going. If we were to say we're not going to do that, um, that increase, we'd have to find the money from somewhere else. So um, it, it's not a zero-sum game for the government. But you're already getting more money because inflation has already hit the price of beer and you're creaming it with the GST. Um, as I've indicated, you know, in terms of the, the forecasts that we deal with, they build in a, a CPI adjustment. If we were to say, OK, we're not going to do that CPI adjustment, then we would have to ultimately, that would create a, another gap in the government's finances that we would need to finance by either raising more revenue somewhere else um, okay. or reducing spending somewhere else. Um, and so we've always got a, it's always a difficult balancing act putting a government's budget together and, and you know, particularly in issues around tax. It's going to cost New Zealanders, according to the association, an extra hundred million dollars a year that we're giving to you in tax. Where will that money go? Will it, will it be ring-fenced to um, alcohol it, prevention or, or harm prevention? Uh, I don't think the excise is ring-fenced. Um, certainly not. I don't think um, right, excise so around alcohol is ring-fenced. Well, as I've indicated, you know, it's, it's, um, if we were to reduce that, um, then we would need to find funding from somewhere else. Can you understand why some people are upset? I mean, what if we taxed your sausage rolls more, Prime Minister? Well, we will be, of course, because the price of sausage rolls is going up, so there will be more GST on that, because if the underlying price goes up, there is more tax on that. That is the nature of inflation. It's one of the reasons we've been very focused on getting inflation back down again, um, so that we can, you know, so that we can reduce the ultimate level of, you know, price increases that consumers are seeing. The Treasury forecasts indicate that we'll be back down um, to within the regular inflation range, so sort of more in that 1% to 3% range by the, towards the end of next year. The Reserve Bank ultimately agreed with that, um, last week, when they um, when they made their decision to top out the official cash rate, so or they made the I guess indication yeah. that they'd top out the okay. official cash rate at its current level. So, uh, you know, I think we all want to see inflation coming back down. That's the fundamental issue here. We've got to get inflation back down again. Yep. You announced an extra eleven million dollars for fog cannons yesterday, and we've just spoken to Ash Palmer, who is a shop owner. We've had him on the show many times before. Um, he says that actually fog cannons make shops more dangerous and criminals more aggressive. Have a listen to Ash Palmer. So do you think that potentially the fog cannons are making the criminals more violent because they want to get in and knock the shop owner or the shopkeeper out before they've got a chance to press the button? 100% they are. And, you know, maybe don't talk to the politicians about this. Talk to the police. They are also of that opinion. You know, and not the high-ranking police because, you know, they say, they say the same things. You talk to the frontline police, they will tell you the same thing, that they are coming in at a rapid rate and they want to take the retailer out because they know they're going to trigger the fog cannon, which is going to limit their time in the store and potentially, you know, decrease their loot. Have you had any shop owners tell you the same thing? 
No, in fact, actually I have visited several shops that have had the fog cannons installed, including some where they've used the fog cannons. I've spoken to those frontline police who have attended those events, and I've spoken to the police who are going and, and doing the retail crime assessment, so helping businesses to identify how to keep themselves safer. And they have indicated that the fog cannons can make a significant difference. In fact, we've seen video footage of, of situations where they've made a, a significant difference. I'm not going to claim for one moment that fog cannons are the ultimate solution to the level of retail crime that we're seeing at the moment. We've got to make sure we see fewer people going into retail outlets and committing crime. But a fog cannon can keep a store owner much safer. Um, it can give them the ability to retreat safely. Um, and actually, um, the evidence shows that businesses that have had a fog cannon installed are less likely to be repeat victimised than businesses that haven't. That was the advice that we got from the police when we, um, when we ramped up the fog Volcanon installations last year. Okay. So he's wrong. Um, let's move on to talk about bilingual road signs. Um, you have accused Chris Luxon of dog whistling, which is a hugely provocative and damaging thing for Chris uh, Luxon to be wearing. Who was he dog whistling to, in your opinion? Well, I think if you look at the comments that Simeon Brown was making, basically saying that because most people speak in English, street signs should only be in English, um, I think that that is um, a dog whistle. To um, who? And I think that, you know, they should be called out on that. To, the, to who? Most, many other countries, you, you, you will know this, you will know this, Ryan, you've travelled around the world, many other countries have bilingual um, street signs. There's nothing to be afraid of in having bilingual street signs. And in fact, if you look at where they're first being rolled out in the cyclone-affected areas of Tairawhiti, Actually, uh, half the population there are Māori. So I, I don't really understand what the concern is. And now they've got their, no, um, totally their campaign manager, Chris Bishop, out there saying, saying that actually this is OK. Yeah. So I'm not sure what Simeon Brown's point is. No, no, I totally, I totally agree with you. I get all that. But who was he dog-whistling to to get votes, as you put it, Chris Luxon? Are you saying that he is dog-whistling to racists? Well, you know, the people who are objecting to having Te Reo Māori used in any context, are they, um, I think are they need to think again, and I don't think... Are they racist people, I, in your opinion? I don't opinion? think the national... Well, I, I, I think people can, you know, people can form their own judgments on that. Well, well, you, but you, I don't you, think that politicians specific... and political leaders yeah, but you, should seek to use to the, the greater use of Te Reo Māori yeah. as a wedge to divide between people. Okay. Te Reo Māori is one of the official languages of New Zealand. It's our indigenous language. I don't think we've got anything to fear by having Te Reo Māori on street signs. Yeah, and I agree with you, but I'm talking about the language that you have used. You have accused Chris Luxon of dog whistling. And uh, Kitty Allen has gone further and says that he is dog whistling to get votes. So do you, do, are you saying that anybody who opposes the signs is inherently racist? No, I'm not saying that at all, but so I'm saying that there's certainly a, a racist under... There is a racist underbelly in some of the public dialogue around this, and that does seem to be an audience the National Party are trying to appeal to. OK. He's, and, and this is Chris Bishop, has said actually their concerns are from elderly uh, people, people who have poor eyesight, who are genuinely worried about not being able to read a road sign should they need to do it in a hurry. Do you think that's legitimate or are they part of the racist undertones that you're discussing? Well, I think if he had a look at the signs, he would see that the, the words in English are still uh, very prominent. No one is going to have any difficulty reading. If English is their only language, no one is going to have any difficulty interpreting what a street sign says. The other thing is, this isn't on the critical safety signs. So in terms of give way, stop signs, those sorts of things, they will still be the same as they have always been. This is around place names. It's around um, direction to amenities those sorts of things. Um, it is not the safety signs. Um, and so one can only um, interpret that they have some other concerns that they're not being upfront about. OK. Let's talk very quickly. Um, when will the zoning decisions be made around houses in uh, Hawke's Bay after the flood in Auckland? The minister indicated it would be weeks away. That was a couple of weeks ago. I'm talking Esk Valley, uh, West Auckland. When will a call be made on those, do you know? 
So, so we're literally in the final decision making process on the categorisation at the moment. So, you know, we, we've, we'll basically have three categories. We'll get people will get an indication of which of the categories they're in within the next week or so. Okay. Um, we've then got a bit more work to do around what happens to people once they're in those categories. But we're working as, as fast as we can to get people that certainty. Of course, I think everyone in that situation will understand it's not a straightforward, totally. cut and dry issue. But, um, but we are, but we are trying to get them uh, decisions as quickly as we can get them. Good to know to be in the next week or so. So um, one last question very quickly. Stuart Nash, I see the donor probes being delayed. Um, have you been made aware of any other issues or concerns relating to any of your MPs and donors and or communication with them, or is it just Stuart Nash? So in terms of other MPs, no. Um, in terms of the Stuart Nash review being done by the Cabinet Office, they haven't kept me up to date with anything that they may have been finding during that okay. uh, process, so I'll, I'll await the outcome, same as everyone else. All right, nice one. Um, Prime Minister, thank you very much for your time, as always. We really appreciate it.